Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this third uh, IFAC uh, Industry Connect panel discussion. I'm Monsef Shiwa, uh, I'm with the Polytechnic Montreal in Canada. Uh, and I will be acting as a moderator for this uh, panel discussion. So a quick uh, organizational aspect for today's panel discussion. So today, um, every panelist will present his uh, personal view through short statements and call for action. And then we will discuss uh, specific points related to today's topic. Also, please remember that uh, all uh, non-presenter participants will be uh, muted and the video will be disabled. Also, to ask a question, please use the Q&A button and we will reserve uh, 10 minutes at the end of this uh, webinar to answer the questions from the audience. Let me introduce uh, today's uh, panelists. So today, uh, round table, we will discuss the evaluation of benefits of uh, optimization, uh, monitoring and control in various industry sectors. So we will discuss how to improve pro plant performance uh, using advanced process control and measurement, how sustained value from control system requires monitoring and recovery actions, and how IT infrastructure can unlock the potential of optimization, monitoring, and control. But we will also discuss other factors that can influence these economic benefits. So today's uh, panelists are renewed experts in process industry, aerospace, and automotive. So we have Lydia Ore. So Lydia is a senior process data scientist at Stone3. She's also an extraordinary associate professor at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Uh, from 2019, she has served uh, various roles at Stone3, including profit and loss manager for the process monitoring business unit and product manager for process monitoring services. Uh, her research interests include data analytics, machine learning for process monitoring in uh, process industry. And she has a particular interest on the topic of today, which is the cost benefit analysis of such topics, of such techniques. So, Luki Nkutsi is a principal engineer, research and development with Mintech. Uh, he's with Mintech since 2008. And uh, Luki has been working on developing and applying robust nonlinear model predictive control, specifically in the mineral processing uh, industry on different uh, mineral processes like milling circuits, thickeners, DMS, leaching, and also underground mining cooling systems. Uh, he has a broad experience in developing and implementing such system and his solution are now world worldwide used in several countries like Australia, US, Chile, Mexico, and Sweden. Oleg, Oleg Gushkin is a technical leader and manager of advanced connectivity analysis at Ford Global Data Insight and Analytics. He's been uh, uh, working with Ford since more than 20 years, specifically on advanced manufacturing, information technology, and research and advanced engineering. Uh, Oleg has been involved in the design and the implementation of advanced information technology and intelligent control for supply chain, for manufacturing, and uh, I think recently for connected vehicles. Then we have uh, Tariq Samad. So Tariq Samad is with the Technological Leadership Institute at the University of Minnesota. Uh, but before that, he spent, uh, I think, more than 30 years with Honeywell. Uh, he ended his career at, at Honeywell as a corporate uh, fellow, which uh, is the highest position in industrial research there. At Honeywell, he led technology developments in uh, multiple areas of automation and control for different sectors like process industry, uh, homes and buildings, advanced manufacturing, aerospace, and also automotive. And finally, we have uh, Stéphane Renou. So Stéphane Renou is the president and CEO of FP Innovation. 
since 2017. FP Innovation is a research institute that uh, specializes in the creation of scientific solution in support of the Canadian forest sector uh, global competitiveness. Uh, but previously, Stefan, I think since 2000, uh, had held uh, several positions at GE, uh, General Electric, including research position in their um, Global Research Center, but also management position in the aviation and in the oil and gas sector divisions. So here are, now you know who are our panelists. So I'm gonna ask now each one of them uh, to quickly please uh, summarize his thoughts on this topic. And uh, we could start with Lydia, if you don't mind. Thanks, Monsef. Let me just grab my screen. All right, um, just a conversation. Uh, uh, can you see my screen, Monsef? Perfect, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, my kind of call to action or note that I want to contribute is the um, uh, idea of uh, monitoring benefits. Now, what I'm showing here uh, in the top left corner is just that uh, control and optimization has got obvious benefits and uh, several of the other panelists will discuss that as well. But to reduce variance and to um, stabilize and optimize and move towards constraints. Now, Advanced Process Control, APC, has got a long tradition of very rigorous benefit estimation. So there's top-down techniques, as you can see here, um, to get like order of magnitude cost savings. And then there's nice formal frameworks for bottom-up estimation, even before you implement the controllers, uh, but also nice rigorous on-off tests after you've implemented controllers. But uh, control and optimization is more than just APC. Specifically, what uh, my interest is and what I've looked at and what we uh, research a lot is looking at sustained value. Uh, once you've commissioned the controller, it won't uh, give you the same uh, uh, value uh, until infinity. You need to sustain it because processes change the whole time because of changing conditions and uh, improving the plants and uh, changing personnel and changing control levels uh, or control layers. So to sustain that benefit, we need to maintain our control systems and specifically um, monitor its performance and detect, diagnose and intervene when it's required. Now, this aspect of control and optimization, estimating that benefit, the benefit of control performance monitoring um, is not that well established in terms of the frameworks and how to quantify it. So there's some, uh, some uh, kind of order of magnitude estimates also based on top-down work and then not so much from a bottom-up perspective. There are some interesting webinars uh, and I give a link over there that you can learn more. Um, but uh, something that I'd like to share and 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 uh, give some uh, seat for thought for everybody on the call is just uh, an approach that we've tried to um, uh, piggyback on the well-established uh, methods for uh, estimating control be benefits from APC. Uh, and we say, well, control performance monitoring uh, means that we can unlock more value from the APC unit by making sure that it's uh, got 100% uh, uh, health most of the time. So what our framework does is we um, look at the potential um, extended time that the system would have been in an unhealthy state um, if we didn't have rapid uh, detection and identification. And then we propagate that time delta through the regulatory control layers, uh, through the APC units, um, and then from there we're on firmer footing uh, based on you know uh, well-established APC benefits. It's very interesting to to see how to do this bottom up. If you are have a case history of lots of different examples of uh, uh, control performance issues, you can uh, plug it in and pump it through this framework. Uh, and then from experience, we've seen a lot of uncertainties uh, arise in this framework. But that's okay. We are control engineers. We're not scared of uncertainties, uh, and in our framework work, we uh, typically deal with it in a Monte Carlo analysis. So that is just a little bit uh, from my side, Monsef. I hope I, I managed to stick to the three minutes um, on um, the how to estimate control benefits uh, with control performance monitoring. Thank you. Very good timing, uh, Lydia. Uh, let's go then to Loki uh, and see his uh, ideas on this topic.
Uh, thank you, Monsef. Uh, can you hear me? I'm just yep. with, uh, there we go. Okay, so basically, I'm connecting up to, um, uh, to Lydia's uh, example here. So in this case, um, again, we uh, where's the benefit coming from from process and instrumentation? Now, uh, we do both um, at Mintec, so we have some instrumentation. So we first have to measure that that you want to improve automatically online. So We've developed some instruments so that you can actually get um, a, a live measurement of your process. And then once you know how your process is moving, you can start to see the opportunities in terms of improvement. So as soon as you add an advanced controller to this, you can reduce the variability. And in this case also, um, this is a cyanide example where you want to minimize, of course, your reagents, your chemicals that you're adding, like cyanide, because there's a cost associated with it. So, if you can control it more accurately, you can lower the set point, that is your optimization, uh, reduce the cost of your cyanide while still getting the performance you want from your process. So, um, so why is this important? I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you're getting, if you're out of specification, if it's a product quality that you're measuring and you're out of spec, you know, there's product loss. Uh, in this case, where it's reagents, um, if you have to increase your set points to compensate for variability, there's by reagents, there's efficiency losses. Um, if you're operating in inefficient areas and you operate further from constraints. So that is where you're getting your, your benefits from. Uh, so how does this benefits translate at a high level? Um, so this is just a few examples that we've done at Mintec um, in different places in the world and different processes. So if we're looking at milling, gold mine in Sweden, just stabilizing the milling. So not even optimized, just getting rid of variability. Uh, it increases the, the recovery of the spirals by 1% and that equates about 750,000 US dollars a year. Um, similar on the flotation, um, just by doing some stabilization of the levels, getting rid of that variability, um, we improved the recovery by 2.1% two, two and that's 600,000 US per year. Here's again a combination of instruments. So we have our cyanide measurement instrument combined with advanced process control um, on leaching. So again, cyanide savings equating to about 400,000 a year. Um, another one where we're looking at um, an, more chemical savings, so cyanide here was 500,000, lime reduction 6.5%, flocculin 9.5%, which I haven't even converted into US dollars. Um, then we're also looking at improved gold recovery. So here's actually product quality improvement. So we have a different uh, instrument connected with a control system. And just by reducing the soluble gold losses, that uh, results in about 700,000 US dollars a year. We move over to furnaces. And in this case, both of them, we're just looking at electrical efficiency. So putting in more electricity into the process. Um, and just by improving the efficiency by 2% to 3%, that equates to 700,000 US dollars in electricity savings on a 50 mega um, uh, v MVA furnace. And then that excludes the production improvement that you can get um, by just consistently putting in the right amount of electricity. Um, so this is, so my case is just to show that um, it's worthwhile improving the efficiencies of your price, even if it's by just a small amount like one or two percent, um, the values add up quickly. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Luigi. Uh, so now that we saw two good example in advanced process control, maybe Ole can can share his opinion from different perspective. Ah, uh, yeah. She can thank share you. His screen. Uh, so, um. Uh, can you see my screen? All right. Uh, thank you, Monsef. As uh, as Monsef mentioned, I um, my experience comes from automotive industry, from uh, Ford Motor Company, and as anybody can imagine, there is no shortage of examples of um, application of monitoring and optimization in automotive industry. It ranges from process control, as my colleagues just. Uh, highlighted the benefits of that all the way to the entire enterprise optimization 
And uh, so uh, uh, this is some some examples, equipment prognostics and condi condition-based uh, maintenance. This is a huge area, and right now it's uh, it's getting more and more uh, well popular with implementation of AI and machine learning-based uh, models. Uh, now, what I would like to focus on the areas where I have direct experience, and this is a like a higher level control at the level of enterprise or entire production system, uh, examples such as production scheduling. And uh, the difference between optimized versus non-optimized production scheduling typically results in, uh, in about 1 million per year per plant savings. Uh, so this savings comes from a reduction of inventory, reduction of premium uh, freight. So sometimes when we miss the deadline for the shipping of the regular mode of transportation, economic mode of transportation, we have to ship it through the premium modes like uh, airplanes or truck versus versus rail. Um, uh, reduction in overtime, so line scheduling, uh, assembly line balancing. Well, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this type of problem. And again, uh, application of optimization, balancing, and monitoring of the line, monitoring of the current state of the line or current balancing versus the sequence of vehicle coming in uh, uh, results in... Uh, uh, a reduction of line stoppages if uh, uh, the operators will be overloaded. And in the last two years, I'm sure uh, everybody aware of the importance of the optimization of the entire supply chain. Uh, we, we had like two years uh we had a lot of examples of disruptions uh, starting with the disruption of our supply chain in asia pacific moving to the rest of the world and as a uh, results of uh those original disruptions now we have a shortage of microchips well we kind of like slowly recovering out of that. And application of the optimization uh, methods and monitoring of the supply chain becomes very crucial because when we have to make sure that there are hundreds of thousands of parts all come together and missing one part, we cannot really produce the vehicle. So monitoring the status of our supply chain, availability of the parts, and also optimizing, optimizing what kind of combinations of uh, the models we can build. So it we're not just park uh, unfinished vehicles all over uh, the parking lot, but we can actually finish those vehicles and uh, deliver it to the customers. That becomes very critical. So outside of uh, supply chain and scheduling, uh, now the new emerging area is uh, connected vehicles. And uh, connected vehicles technology and connectivity allows us to monitor the performance of the products which we sell and provide to customers. If before, basically, we primarily, after we sell the vehicle to the customers, we have... Uh, kind of like very li uh, little opportunities to monitor our product, our product usage or um, monitor any uh, potential problems only through the uh, information from the dealerships. Now, with the, with the connectivity, we can monitor well 24-7 and there are um, uh, we, we can already see a lot of benefits out of this monitoring and optimization of the products, like product analytics, uh, prognostics, location-based uh, uh, services, cloud-based feature analytics and optimization. So in many times it... Uh, uh, it provides additional services to all uh, to our customers, but also for us as a company, it allows to optimize our products and also to identify any potential problems with the products early on, so uh, to avoid any um, costly recalls, uh, which uh, basically one of the key um, issues in automotive industry. So uh, with that. Um, Yes, I provided some of the examples, which are slightly different from uh, more traditional process controls. Uh, and uh, hope it keeps thank you. you, thanks a lot, Oleg. Uh, so let's see if I get technical problems. If it's possible. <laughs> All right. So it's interesting hearing all my uh, co-presenters here talking. I realize how much I. I'm a corrupt researcher that became an executive, so I feel a bit ashamed today to talk to you, but that's okay. We'll survive through that. 
so, so listen, I mean, uh, what I want to show to you a little bit is a bit of a perspective from the forest industry side. Uh, the forest industry is at an interesting spot. Uh, you know, I, I've been, as you said, Tarek, in the oil and gas industry, in the uh, aerospace industry, where performance and price, I mean, it's pretty clear what the metrics are and what to do to get money out. So as a controller process engineer, you know what you need to push on a little bit more, reduce variability, get additional feature to the product. It's easy. On the forest industry, where we are today is actually at a crossroad. It's the crossroad of the social license to operate and the crossroad of the potential of technology to grow. The potential for growth is everything you can do with the forest to fuel the bioeconomy, which is coming down to using every molecule of a tree in a certain fashion to replace other products that don't have the same level of sustainability. It's also to transform the industry to enable it to be less of a bad actor from a GHG perspective, ensure we have renewable forest practices. All through that, through a lot of social license perspective, a lot of technology perspective, the forest industry is not typically the most advanced technology. If you look at people cutting trees in the forest, you have extremely high end operation in some part of the world. In others, it's still people with chainsaws in the field. So how do we get there? What do we do? Well, first, let's recognize three things. The forest industry, it's all about economic growth. It's a huge economical player. In Canada, it's about 10%. It's a huge player in the climate change equation because forest does capture CO2s and can be used as a CO2 sink. And it's also a huge factor in regional development. So those are the fundamental vector for economic and social value. So what are the challenges? Well, First, I mean, forest is cool, right? It's a great outdoors. It's great to be out there, should we think about. It's great to be in the forest. Well, the problem we have is there's not that many people that want to be that far away. Sending engineer to the field to resolve problems to the mills is becoming a growing problem. I mean, my friend Tarek has been at Honeywell. I mean, they were doing a lot of optimization in several pulp and paper mills. Having engineers that go there that serve the system is more and more difficult. Having receiving hands is a problem. Having qualified engineer in the field that can take those solutions is becoming the biggest problem. So in a nutshell, to get stay in my three minute, Monsef, great transformation of the industry towards bioeconomy, limited availability of staff in the mills, in the forest to receive the technology, high variability of the biomass itself, if you don't believe in global warming, do realize that the forest is changing now. The species are not the same at the same location as before, and the industry has to change based on that. High uncertainty of the economics forward of carbon. We don't have a good set of well-established rule of how carbon will be monetized forward in minimal ways. So then it induces a lot of pressure on the industry. So we need to help with control, optimization, of combined process economics and process design, we need to help the industry transform. Huge potential for automation. Just keep this in your mind. Today, I can, with drones, look at every tree in the forest, tell which species in it, how much meter cube of wood it can produce. I can get that data flowing back to the entire system and optimize. There is no way I can teach each of the players in the line what to do to make to get to that optimal point. That's the challenge. How do I get to precise, concise solutions? I yield, myself. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so we're we gonna close with Tarek in this uh, short presentation. All right, working this time. Um, uh, thank you. So as uh, Monsef uh, mentioned, I'm at the University of Minnesota now, but I spent 30 years before then with Honeywell. And this uh, first slide I have here goes back to more than a decade ago now, where we were we were realizing that we had all this control expertise in multiple different areas that had had created lots of value for the company and of course for our customers, and we were looking at where which other areas might be good areas to exploit our advanced control expertise in, and we actually and identified one, and that was very successful. But initially, we struggled 
with trying to convince an industry sector that was not using advanced control of the value of advanced control. And so we had did an internal exercise putting together for all some many of the applications we do, what's the real value? And you know, when you put a control engineer in front of a business customer, they might talk about, you know, control performance or stability or robustness or you know time to set point or you know whatever else it is but that's really not what the the sort of the level at which we are trying to sell these solutions at that's not what they care about right they care about the economics so it took us some effort to get to this but we created um, this slide this is actually a sort of a subsequent version of it and I'm not going to go through all of it but you can see it really is focused on things that matter to the customers and just to mention like a couple of things so an oil refinery right with advanced control this is with model predictive control that's one dollar per barrel of all crude oil refined uh, as the annual benefit uh, from from advanced control what does that translate to for a large refinery it or translates to over 100 million dollars a year right so that's the scale of benefit that you can get just with advanced control. This is not PID control. In fact, this is not even higher level optimization. This is just model predictive control installations. And then other things like look, lower calibration time in pulp and paper, which is a huge deal uh, for paper mills and paper machines. Uh, and then a bunch of other things uh, like that. In fact, design time is a pretty big issue and calibration time in many, in many industries. Uh, just a couple of years ago, I was involved uh, in another activity trying to sort of document uh, what messages should we do, do control researchers need to, need to appreciate in order to understand how control gets translated to industrial benefit and economic and societal uh, benefit. Um, and so we, in this, you know, this paper, I'll, next slide will show some messages, these messages, but we had really some really good examples from a wide swath of industries uh, here as well, you know, process control, plant-wide control and optimization, uh, water networks, uh, warehouse robotics, um, you know, every, every mobile phone in the world has over six critical control loops operating inside it. Uh, Medtronic talks about revenue in the billions of dollars from automatic control of, of insulin. Billion plus uh, disk drives have been shipped that have, that, that, that new synthesis based feedback control. And uh, then just my last slide, uh, these were the messages we came up with and this, this reference is available here um, where we really are trying to talk to the, the audience, which is you know, control engineers and scientists and who are interested in industrial impact. But what is it that they need to appreciate over and above the technical expertise that they have? And so, you know, um, things like cost reduction is a big priority. Economic expectations need to be understood. Uh, implementation architectures are industry specific, a uh, whole number of things like that. And I'll just uh, stop there and we can move on to the Q&A. Thank Thanks a lot, Tariq, uh, for this uh, presentation. So uh, I think through all your presentation, we understood that clearly optimization control and uh, monitoring has a, a direct impact on the economic benefit and that goes from chemical savings to recovery quality improvement improved electrical efficiency reduction of inventory a reduction of line stoppage uh, higher production rates and so forth uh, now that we are convinced that there is an economical benefit uh, i want to touch upon how to evaluate it or how to estimate this economical fit based on data or models. Or, so my, my first question to you guys would be how to quantify for this, uh, this economical impact for a specific application. So are there, are there commercial solution available on the market? Is it something that each one of us should develop on its own. Uh, I, I think media could be a good candidate to, to start discussing that according to the slide she shows, if you don't mind, media, sorry. 
thanks, Monsef. I think it would be very nice if there was a commercial package, uh, <laughs> quantify benefit uh, uh, trademark, <laughs> if you could do that. I think the experience that we've seen is that there's a lot of um, process context that you need to put into the calculation of a benefit. So there's some generic elements to quantifying the benefit of uh, control that you can do, like you want to compare periods where it's not on versus periods where it is on. And then you gather information from the system in terms of, you know, the KPIs that are relevant throughput and yield and things like that, so that you can do a statistical analysis. So those are kind of generic for um, automated control uh, before, uh, after analysis or on off analysis. But then what becomes very interesting is, uh, you know, defining that KPI, you know, uh, sometimes just stabilizing isn't sufficient to show a monetary value uh, because because you're just tightening the distribution, the mean stays the same. Uh, so then you need to have some penalty for extreme events. Uh, what's also interesting is uh, um, when a controller is switched off by an operator, for example, it might be due to some extreme events that your controller wasn't designed for. So then it's a little bit unfair to use that off data, uh, which is then very extreme against your on data. Um, so no, there's no, <laughs> you can't import uh, APC benefit estimator in Python and then <laughs> dump your process historian on it and get some value out. There is some generic uh, uh, rules and that paper by uh, some of the references that I showed, uh, Margaret Bauer has written some interesting ones and Prof Ian Gregg from University of Pretoria has been involved with research like that. So there's, there's basic best practices, but on top of that, you need to understand your problem. And if you want to check for benefits of monitoring the APC, like I showed, that's, that's quite unexplored territory and that's mostly bottom up ad hoc estimates. Thank you, Lydia. Um... Anybody else would like to, to comment on practical experience in evaluating benefits? To I'll just say that one, one general general issue in across many industry sectors is that that you know the, the, the from the point of view of the control people developing these new solutions, it's hard it's hard to get customers to adopt them because many of these applications are safety critical or have critical sort of performance aspects to it. And it, there's a lot of risk that, that a company is taking if it becomes, tries to be the first one to adopt something. So getting that first customer, that sort of reference customer or the first couple of customers, it's really crucial. And that's that's in every, in every industry sector, actually, not just uh, process industries. And I, I just would like to add on uh, Tarek's comment about the first customer. So within, uh, let's say, even within one company, it's always very difficult to get the first, very first uh, system in place. And uh, so very often it starts with like pilot or prototype where we kind of like uh, the pilot or this prototype is a research project to actually uh, analyze the potential benefits. And after we can prove out that it's successful and get some uh, quantitative measures, then we can create a business case for replication of uh, uh, this type of product. And um, so another point I would like to make also, so when we create the business case with the estimation of the benefits, so we have to look at two sides, right? So one is what is the savings we get from this advanced application? And what is the cost of the implementation and maintaining it? Because sometimes, uh, you know, especially when we talk about some advanced technique implementation of, let's say, uh, now uh, quantum computing, right? It's very expensive. And we need to see, well, what is the cost of this implementation and maintenance versus how much we will save? So, because we definitely will save inventory, but maybe it will be only 10% and it's not that expensive and it costs less than implementation of the solution itself. So it's kind of like even implementation itself is an optimization problem. So we have to um, look at those trade-offs. Yeah. And if I may myself, I think Oleg is right on here that there's a lot of good comments in there. The few things. First, I mean, we got to think like CFOs when we talk about benefits, right? And for a company, it's simple. It's if you're in a cost-driven company, it's CAPEX and OPEX. There's nothing else, capital cost and operational cost. If you can't quantify what you do in those terms, you're not even in the game because you will compete with others. 
each metrics have their own, each company have their own uh, metrics, right? In the forest industry, it's mainly uh, payback time. So from time you get money in the project to the time you're seeing the return of that money equally, that's your payback time. It's seven to eight months in the industry today. From a capped buying a piece of equipment to a control project, it's the same. Don't care from a shareholder perspective, money is money. So put ourselves on that. My last comment is the this one. I use that in my business today. In my research center, everybody is measured on CAPEX and OPEX benefits and payback time. Whatever they do, control engineers, process engineer, mechanical. So they have a better dialogue after. Here's a problem with us control engineer, and I put myself in that category. We are shy of telling the benefit we can get. Because of the safety critical nature of the work, we don't want to commit. And then we don't get on the same level as others that are actually taking a lot more risk because they know then it's just a sell. Then you will need to prove out. Then you need to have the first cost, etc. So we need to get out there a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, I think. Um, sorry, just a quick uh, comment <laughs> on my side. I think it's the same. It's uh, to take that risk, as uh, Stefan has said. Is how do you quantify or how do you how do you how much uh, confidence do you have in your estimate up front? We know from history that it's there and uh, I'm sure it as well. You can see the benefits, but. How do you know in this specific case you will be able to get 2% again? And um, in order to say, okay, this is going to be justified in terms of the cost of the thing you pay. And I think that is, that is still the thing, it's just building that confidence in your estimates um, that you can estimate it up front, validate it with data afterwards. Um, that is, that's, the, that's the critical part. Okay, so to come back to Stefan's comment, how could we increase our confidence? How could we have an idea of reducing the risk? I, I think we need tools. And Lydia was talking about an example of tool to get an idea of the economic benefits. How generic is that, Lydia? You said we need a lot of process context. Uh, so sh is it should we develop a research project uh, every time we develop a control solution for a tool to estimate its benefit? Preferably not, uh, but I think there's I think there's a whole gamut, and I think it's horses for courses, and we've got different order of magnitudes depending on different phases of the project that we have. So I think like the slides that Tariq shows is you know an N when we are trying to conceptualize the ideas, and so we add complexity as we need to add complexity, and I think it's also an invitation to the uh, research community and the academic community to say you know these are que these are important questions. How do we uh, develop cost-benefit frameworks so that uh, we don't have to develop them from scratch every time we, we do a project in industry? So I think it's definitely horses for courses. Your initial estimates, that should be the uh, back of a napkin where you can just look at what your revenue streams are and what your cost elements is and apply some factors. Um, but then as you get particular per context, I think there is scope uh, for um, developing frameworks that take that into account. Um, so uh, there's, and, and hopefully our, our, our research colleagues can help us with that. But I, I don't see that as a, a sexy research field, <laughs> unfortunately. So I don't know, uh, maybe us in industry should uh, put some money out there uh, to make it a sexy research field. Thank you, Diga. So uh, I can quickly to... jump yeah. in again. Um, I think there is no, there is no silver bullet. There's no magic wand, but they are. They are very good, well-established systems engineering tools that really address this issue of risk reduction, right? So even something like the use of technology readiness levels, and you see it, the technology readiness level scale, and you realize, well, these are the steps involved going from the laboratory prototype to the initial test in, in some an environment, which is not the operational environment, to the next test. And you have to go through step by step. And the whole reason to go step by step is to do risk reduction uh, rather than jump, jump all in and sink or swim. Very good point, Tariq. You can inspire yourself from domains of system engineering. Uh, now that we've talked about the, the framework, um, I, I want to come back to this idea that uh, novel IT architecture could have an impact actually on the 
economic benefit of this kind of solution. What has changed since 20, 30 years, I would say today we could make more benefit from advanced solution like optimization, control, monitoring that we could have done uh, three decades ago. Could comment on that, Oleg? Yeah, so uh, definitely there are a lot of changes, which actually makes it uh, much easier, much faster and more economical to try out and implement um, uh, different techniques. Well, AI, machine learning uh, 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 tools, uh, but also um, emergence of cloud computing, where now we don't need to buy servers anymore. We don't need to spend huge capital investment anymore. We can uh, use infrastructure as a service on demand only to try out. And if something doesn't work, we can just uh, basically cancel it. But what's uh, uh, to me, it seems also interesting that the changes in um, kind of like organizational structure, especially at, as it relates to IT in organizations. Now we can see the proliferation of the analytics departments in many companies, which actually acts as a feedback control and optimizer at the enterprise level. So basically, if we if we follow the control principles and the feedback control, now we can see that that's what's happening at the, at the enterprise levels. So... Um, um, yeah, that's that's what I, I again. That's what I see the benefits again uh, uh, in uh, changes in IT infrastructure and capabilities, but also following the org structure of the organizations. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else has uh, experience with the impact of technology on the benefits of control well, if, optimization? If I may make a comment from a business perspective, Monsef. I think what Alex said is right on. There is a lot of availability. Cloud computing have opened all the doors. Data access is not what it was in the past. I can now have access to all the data of the mail in a, a week without too much problem if the wheel is well wired. Here's the challenge. The staff on the mail is overwhelmed by all that data. They are absolutely overwhelmed by all of us that go to them and say, we can do this, we can do that, we can do it. it it's incredible. And believe me, they pass through a lot of bad experience of consultant coming in, asking the big price for analytics of what is the problem to resolve. So I, I think we, we have to pay extreme attention of creating those first good customers, those first, first implementation that really focus maybe on more simple things, but make them happen quickly. So they feel it and we kind of baby feed a bit the system. Uh, too many, I'm going to optimize everything, happen, and then the door gets shot, despite the potential. I think I want to also just connect there. I think um, the, the problem or the risk that lies with technology is that people say, oh, we have all of these algorithms, we just throw data at it, we'll spit out answers, but we don't have to know anything about what's going on. We don't need the domain knowledge anymore. And, and that is a big risk that can come up with all of these newer systems is we would put too much trust in the algorithms and not enough trust in actually having the main knowledge to interpret that uh, to make sure that you're getting a solution that actually provides benefit and not end up with something that's actually worse off there. Maybe also just to add to that in, in our experience at Stone 3, as a, a process monitoring service company and not a process monitoring product company, you don't just want to give another dashboard for somebody to look at with lots of alarms on it. So we've also learned that, you know, you've got to walk the road. So we, when we see something uh, happening, an, an event default, we open a case, that case is visible to everybody on site, we generate advisories, and then we're tenacious about it. We follow every single case and advisory that we've generated with like, daily, weekly interactions, getting to know site, getting to know their context, and then follow and close 
only when something has been resolved or it's been said that, okay, no, this is not relevant, it's not applicable, you weren't right. So we've got this massive uh, repository of experiences built up that, and the relationships that we've built. And then for each and every single resolved case, we, we go back and we try to do a benefit estimation and see what actual difference did that make and then communicate that back to our clients and that and we learned I learned the, the many lessons in the last three years in industry versus what, what I thought process monitoring was in academia by that just that tenacity of you know following up on every recommendation that you make was it valuable uh, was it accurate um, and was it uh, enacted okay Th thank you thank you Lydia, for this uh, this testimony um, unless somebody else wants to comment on the impact of IT. No? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, 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 quick, I'll make a quick comment just to support something that Oleg said. And this is, you know, this whole area of, um, uh, of industrial Internet of Things or Industry 4.0, this combination of pervasive sensing, you know, powerful computing at the edge where appropriate, then the cloud implementations, the connecting with the users and uh, having having sophisticated algorithms that are too sophisticated to be run on site, to be running in, in the cloud. You know, examples where this has been used, I, this is now from some years ago and Stefan will might know more about this than I do from his GE uh, days, but uh, the whole area of digital twins and how it, how it led to led to new diagnostic capabilities for aircraft engines. So when an, when an aircraft lands, data is automatically communicated to offline and in some cases not even maintained by, by the aircraft manufacturer, but by, by the engine manufacturer and, uh, and, and analyze. And if an, an, a, a, a maintenance activity needs to be done earlier than scheduled, it can, be, it can be scheduled right away. Or if things are working fine, maybe it doesn't have to be done then. Similar things are happening in the healthcare space with medical devices, uh, you know, implanted devices where data is being communicated to the web, where it's being or to the cloud, where it's being analyzed with people in the loop at that end. And if something needs to be fixed, it can be fixed uh, fixed uh, pretty pretty promptly. So I think there's a lot new uh, potential and opportunity now for closing the loop in in systems uh, like this because of because of the advancement with uh, with this you know IoT and similar technologies. And also, if I can follow up on what Tarek said, it's actually interesting, this uh, notion of digital twin that was uh, there, out there in the cloud. It, we use buzzword left and right and center, right? This is model-based control at the end. Let's be clear. Uh, two things, though, that happen in that ecosphere. There is the fundamental thermal dynamics, chemical process-driven physics-based model and there is the data-driven model. And what I've shown good and bad things, and I'm not gonna take a side today, right? But it's the importance of understanding the process or the engine you're trying to control. There's someone brilliant in chemical engineering somewhere that say, well, process control is a big P and a small C. If you understand your process well, you will be able to do the small control and do wonders. So I don't remember the name of this individual, I apologize, but I think it was brilliant. And what we do with our craft engine, if you want to know, it's actually the full, complete, detailed, thermomechanical, physics-based model that run on the engine that send data back. And you know the rest, you know that stuff, the common filtering and all those great things that make it happen. That, that's where the magic is, right? It's getting that done on site, on the edge, Tariq, as you said, right? So you can have that compute power on the edge but the knowledge, the understanding of your process is the core of everything. The analytics help us see things, and then we can go dig and add more knowledge. Thanks for that, Stefan. Just to okay. pop in, just I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. but I just want to sort of. I think this is a this is also a word of caution against blindly adopting machine learning and AI and big data techniques. Let's get the data, it'll solve all our problems without, without some understanding of the actual physical domain and the, and the system, uh, the solutions will not be reliable for the sorts of applications we're talking about. Thank you David, for this important remark. Uh, uh, for time is running, uh, I want to close on a topic related to the topic of today, which is the economical benefits. So you convinced us that control optimization monitoring has a, an impact on the 
economics that uh, IT is now ready and uh, is an enabler and uh, also with uh, a lot of process knowledge. Uh, but these are all technical aspects. Uh, is, is it really everything to achieve economical benefits of this area, this, this uh, technical aspect, or are there other factors that we should take into account to maximize this benefit? Maybe Stefan could comment on that with the experience. Well, well, listen, let me think. I've talked a bit about it myself, so I'm not going to take too much time, but it's people, 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 right? The emitting and the receiving and, and the lack thereof. Uh, I think that's going to be our challenge forward. I think it's, I think the IT people do sometimes it better than we do, which is this notion of total cost, right? The, the cost, if I got a great algorithm, then I need to put it in place. I need to train the people. I need to maintain it. I need to do this and I need to calculate the total cost of the experience. Uh, if we take those management practice that seems boring to our control engineer, I know, but they are so important because the maintenance of the model, as you know well, using MPC and et cetera in, in a mill, it's huge. And when you don't have the people that are used to do it at the mill anymore, then it collapses on you. So th that's the, the total view, right? Not just the benefit of the algorithm, but the total view of what it is to maintain it in a mill in a product. I think that's what we need to think about. No, I think we have to adopt a broader perspective. In fact, it's not just about the technology and having success with technology requires many other pieces to, to fall into place as well. And one thing we haven't discussed here so far is the topic of, of policies and regulations and legislation. And, you know, uh, for many of these applications we are talking about, uh, there are, they are, they are things you can do and things you can't do because of constraints that are imposed by not just by customers, but by nations and governments and international organizations uh, in some cases as well. And so, you know, if you're a major company, you're spending a lot of money and time lobbying legislatures to adopt solutions and new policies and new, or, or trying to promote new standards that will help you sell what you're trying to sell, right? And conversely, if you're really, there are many organizations that are really, really trying to protect the environment, protecting the consumer, um, and all of this stuff is happening in the site too, and and how that evolves will dramatically impact what what solutions get adopted and how much economic value for companies uh, is made and and how much value for society is is gained through that through that process as well. Yeah, I think um, just on a simpler note, um, our experience is that um, just even adoption from the guys that need to use this technology is important. If they rejected because it's not lining up with the experience, you're not going to get that benefit even if it's proven. Um, so it's an old change management, it's a training exercise, it's churn that happens. So there's a lot of people aspects, but there's also process issues. Uh, the processes do change, or uh, in our case, and, and, and when I was processing, the ore changes quite often. And, and like in the forestry, the, the forest change, and that, that has that has impact um, on on the performance of these systems. So, um, so there's a lot of other factors that that, that play a role, not just the technology, uh, in how successful or not successful they are. Maybe I can also add to that. I think the, we can also spend a little bit more time explicitly thinking about the impact that uh, control optimization and monitoring has on the workforce that, uh, you know, once change management has success, been successful, once we get uptime for our solutions, you know, what um, what are the changes then required for the workforce? Um, because we're not automating them away. We're releasing their uh, general intelligence uh, to higher order tasks, you know, to the, the wicked learning rather than the simple learning problem. So, I mean, and we've had uh, uh, feedback uh, from um, s people on site, the metallurgists on site to say that, you know, if only I could spend more time thinking about this type of problem rather than worrying about, you know, these uh, valves that keep getting stuck. So that's also something interesting to think about. I think as control engineers, we want to make things better and faster and cleaner and automated. But we, uh, for that total cost, like Stefan was hinting at, there's also a total benefit. You know, your 
people that are running around with spanners and running around and having to look physically at flotation cells, you know, what wonderful creative potential will these people now have because they don't have to uh, worry about things that's been automated away. So, and I, and I think there's also fear there in terms of my job will be replaced by a robot, but there's also potential and opportunity and, and upside and realities and, and total cost and total benefits. And it, it's interesting. Um, I don't have the answers and maybe Tariq and the, your experience, you might know more about it, but what role is the, the control community um, and IFAC even perhaps playing in, in investigating that change in the way that the world works? Yeah, we need to be doing more in that context and um, communities like IFAC and other similar ones tend to their their customer base and their membership base is largely the research community so you know at the same time all of all of us want to have an impact in the real world as well and that that gap isn't easy to bridge so that's actually the, the the rationale for setting up the ifac industry committee that uh, several of us are are on um, yeah all right thank you thank you everybody for your valuable comments and uh, thoughts uh, I'm looking at the q and A. I I don't see any questions from the audience. Um, so we still have a couple of minutes for the audience to ask questions, if any. If not, then just a quick uh, uh, announcement to the audience. Uh, if uh, you like today's uh, presentation uh, and you would like to participate as well as a panelist, please contact me. We are always looking for interesting opinion on this important topic on how to bridge the gap between industry and uh, academic control communities. So please reach out to me anytime. Uh, so I don't still don't see any question. So I would like uh, to thank again, all the panelists uh, for their presentations today. And uh, it's now time to close our uh, third IFAC uh, Industry Connect webinar. And uh, you will receive hopefully invitations for the next webinar soon. <laughs> and, and uh, but uh, if you have any ideas on topics that uh, are interesting for you, and also uh, your ideas are also welcome, please send us your ideas and your comments. Thanks again uh, to our panelists. Thanks to the audience uh, for staying that long. Uh, and uh, see you in the next uh, IFAC Industry Connect webinar. Thank you. <laughs>